a time when the topics of feminism and locker room talk have reached every level of society, from conservative, conservative media outlets to dinner tables, we're honored to have today with us someone whose voice has long been part of the conversation around feminism, gender, media, and culture. She's the host of the Call Your Girlfriend podcast, a weekly columnist at the nymag.com, and a regular contributor to the Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, Elle, The New Republic, and many more. As she so aptly put it in an NY Mag piece titled, Can We Just Like Get Over the Way Women Talk? She's never been shy about opening her mouth and telling you exactly what she thinks. Everyone, please welcome Ann Friedman. Hi. Um, man, when I was watching April's talk, she said this thing when she was in the side projects part of it, where she described them as things she wanted to protect or maybe keep safe and away from her work life. And I was like, oh man, my whole talk is about how I just mercilessly drag all of that stuff into my, my paid work life. And, um, and then I was like, she put it so much better and I'm supposed to be a writer. Anyway, everyone has their hangups. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about like these two concepts writ large, but when I think about um, the stuff in, in the former category, in the love category, um, it's really, it's, I mean, I don't know, I don't always, like, I'm not aware of it as a thing that I love, that I'm doing for love. It's often, like, the thing I'm doing because it just seems, like, fun, or a thing I was doing because I was bored and waiting for a meeting to start, or a thing I was doing because it amused me, because I had too many drinks, to see if I could do it, uh, to see if I could do it with friends. Um, that's a great reason to do something. Um, anyway, so I'm talking about a lot of different stuff, not just like I feel a passion deep within my bones, because normally it doesn't work that way. I'm just like, I'll try it. Um, versus things we do for money, which, I mean, this is much more straightforward, right? Like I made a thing and someone paid me money for it. Um, but I think that um, I've definitely found, I've been a freelancer for four and a half years. I'm gonna talk about what that means in a little bit. Um, but I've definitely found that the longer I do it, the blurrier the line gets for me between what I'm gonna keep for me <laughs> in the realm of kind of messing around and feeling creative and what I'm gonna try to make money off of or, or do more publicly or professionally. Um, and so before I go any further, I have to say that this is like, like ultimate like luxurious problem where I'm like, I make a full-time living doing a creative thing I love and I can't figure out which things to move around. I don't feel like I could really talk to you about this without acknowledging that um, I feel really lucky to have this problem. And I'm sure if anyone in this room is also in the kind of patchwork, creative, self-employed realm and like able to pay rent and make a living, you also feel really lucky for that. So just wanna, just wanna acknowledge that. Um, anyway, but so important thing, I work alone at home. Um, I, <laughs> this is the most accurate gif I've ever found <laughs> to <laughs> describe my, I also love this movie, um, but to describe my home self-employment life. Um, and, and yeah, and my, my income is super patchwork. My main gig, um, as Nicole mentioned, is at a columnist for New York Magazine, which has been my like, financial baseline mainstay for a long time. But uh, my, my income is super patchwork, or um, I have a management consultant, Boo, and he would call it diversified, which once I learned that, I was like, oh, there's a business term for this. I was very excited. Anyway, but no, I, I let, let the GIF like, not mislead you. No two days or two weeks are the same. Um, anyway, and so this is actually, this, um, this level of freedom kind of feeds the dilemma of like what to make money from and what not to. Um, in the past, it looked more like this. It was sort of like, there was stuff I did for, which side am I standing on? Yeah, there's stuff I did for work <laughs> that was, you know, a nine to five day job, actually more like nine to nine most of the time and some weekends. I was a magazine editor um, for a long time. And then the other side was sort of like the stuff I did after hours and, you know, while some ideas from the kind of side project-y love for fun area would inform the things I did for money, it was really like I could probably plot everything I did on one side or the other. Um, yeah, and so when my life looked like this, I was um, the editor, click, of a magazine called Good, um, which um, was a really all-consuming job. We had like a daily website. 
and a quarterly print magazine, which you see there, because it's a lot prettier to show you a print magazine than a website, <laughs> even though we spent more time on the website. And, um, and that was just sort of like a capstone of like, you know, all of the jo editing jobs I had had before that. It was like, you know, it was a, it was a day job, day job. Um, but anyway, and then in the summer of 2012, they decided they didn't want to be a magazine anymore. They wanted to be a social network, and they fired us all. Look, I can make it flame. Um, <laughs> They fired us all, which is like, it is a, it is a not so secret secret of a lot of self employed and freelance people that we got there because we were laid off or fired, not because we were following our bliss. Sorry about the title of the talk. Um, <laughs> like, it was more like I was like trying to figure out how to eat and monetize everything I know how to do to make that happen. Um, we can watch it burn for one second longer. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm really not bitter. Um, anyway, so, so more accurately now, instead of that line in the middle, I kind of see it, this is like the jankiest spectrum of all time, but more like a spectrum, um, where you could, in theory, take everything that I do and plot it somewhere on the line. So, you know, maybe there's a few things that I do exclusively for money, and otherwise I would never touch them. There's a few things that I do actually protect and keep as like side projects or things that I want to do for myself or my friends, but Mostly, it's just a lot of stuff in between that's somewhere on the spectrum. Um, anyway, so let's talk about the money stuff, um, which a lot of this started off maybe closer to the love corner and then moved, <laughs> moved on onto money as time went on. Um, the, first, the first money gig of my freelance life uh, was this column at The Cut, and I love that she also referenced the column I happened to take the screenshot up. I was like, we didn't even coordinate that. Um, Anyway, and it's a, it's a weekly column. I've been doing it, writing once a week about something that has to do with gender, politics, and culture for four and a half years, which is really long. <laughs> um, and some weeks it feels like it's love, you know? Like some weeks I'm like, yes, there's nothing I would rather do than write about this issue or call experts about this topic. Um, and then there are a lot of weeks where I'm like, I have no good ideas. I actually don't care about anything. I'm so burnt out on this election or this topic or whatever. I'm doing it because I'm obligated to do it and because it's how I pay my rent. So, you know, at any given week, this can kind of slide along that scale. Um, and it's hard for me to really fix it somewhere. But uh, undeniably, it's been my financial backbone for all the years of my self-employment. Um, and I was really lucky because... Um, they were redesigning and sort of reconceptualizing this corner of New York Mag's website right around the time that I got fired and I happened to know someone there and it was like the luckiest break of all time because um, you know, consistent work um, is what makes freelance life possible for me. Anyway, um, so I also make these pie charts. This is sort of what I was referencing when I was like, things we do while we're drunk or bored. <laughs> um, I made the, they're, they're sort of like personal essays, but like in a faux information graphics format. Like there's really no reason this, any of these ever need to be in a pie chart, but people just love charts. And it's funnier, like it's somehow funnier than if I just wrote out a paragraph about what, how I'm scared of vacationing in Iceland and childbirth and why I would never go to Burning Man or whatever. Like it's funnier to just put it in a slice for some reason. Um, and so I'd been doing this, I think I made the first one in 2010, um, and I would like put them on my Tumblr or whatever, and it was really nothing I did consistently. And then after I got fired and I was like, okay, what can we make money off of here? <laughs> um, there was a small blog called The Hairpin that paid me to make one a week. And um, they, this, this is not an early artist rendering. This is like how they appear on the internet. <laughs> I should just say that in case anyone, they, it is part of the charm that it's like I drew them on the back of a napkin. The first one was actually drawn on the back of a napkin. Um, anyway, and so um, I continue to do that weekly. Um, it, is, it is still a weekly practice today, although it's changed a little bit in terms of how I make money off of it. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, anyway, so then I also have this gig as a contributing editor to The Gentlewoman, um, which is a British like women's profile and fashion magazine. This is a cover story I wrote about Robin, which is like I know like technically I did it for money, but like honestly I would have paid them to like get the opportunity to go do that. Also, Robin is incredible. Um, anyway, we had like three cocktails together and took a selfie. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that's why it's love. Um, <laughs> but you know, but but also like again like somewhere on the spectrum, a little bit of a little bit of money too. Um, and then I write for a lot of other places, and these also individually kind of slot into different um, 
different places on the spectrum. Um, you know, women's magazines pay pretty well, but they make me want to stab my eyeballs out. Um, like the editing process is pretty painful. <laughs> um, you know, and then there are other places I write for, like this great, um, you know, small journal called The Baffler, where they can't pay me, you know, they can pay me barely anything, but I get incredible editing and I love the work that I make there. So, you know, all of these individual assignments, again, can be, can be plotted out. Um, in 2013, I started doing this email newsletter, which um, it didn't look this pretty then. I don't even know that this looks that pretty now. Every, graphic designers avert your eyes. Um, but it definitely uh, did not start. It started as a thing. I was like, I'm just going to do this every week because I kind of miss editing and putting together a weekly newsletter of things that I liked on the internet felt like it used my editing brain. Um, and then I also had, yeah, I guess I did maybe kind of start this more in the money category now that I tell you about it. I also had this idea that if my editors saw my name in their inbox once a week, even if they never opened it, maybe they would be like, my name would come to them a little faster when it came time to make an assignment, when they're like, hmm, we need someone to write about Robin. <laughs> uh, they might just think of me um, more readily. So anyway, um, but, and, it, and it, grew, it grew quite a bit. I, I started doing it on Tiny Letter and um, last year, my subscriber base got too big for what they allow, which means I had to start paying for a service, and when you switch to a real email service, they make you put an address at the bottom. Like, there's a law that says it has to be a real address, and I'm like, I'm not putting my home address, so I had to get a P.O. box, and I had to get, like, I had to basically get a lot of stuff in place to support the newsletter, and so I was like, okay, well, it's one thing for it to be a labor of love, and I'm fine with that, but it's not going to be a labor of debt. And so I was like, I'm going to try to figure out how to make a little bit of money off of it. And at that point, I had, now I have about 25,000 subscribers, and I had fewer than that then, but um, it was enough that I was like, okay, maybe if I try a couple of different tactics to make some money, I won't, I won't you know, go into the hole on this, on this side project. Um, so those pie charts that I showed you before, um, I'd been putting the one I made each week into the newsletter, and I was like, well, you know, maybe instead of selling that to someone else, I could own it and say, you can only see it if you pay me as a subscriber. And the rate is low. It's like $5 a year. It's half the cost of subscribing to like a glossy magazine, which is also cheap and also no one wants to do. But anyway, um, <laughs> so, and if, you, and if you don't pay, you just see a little slot that's like, hey, nudge, nudge, you could be seeing a pie chart. Um, and, and, you know, other people would see one of those hand-drawn charts there. Um, and then I also made this classified section, which is kind of like the old-fashioned classifieds and ads in the back of a newspaper. And I had this idea because I was like, I want it to be cheap. Like, I want people who are also like me, who are self-employed or who are like small business people, to be able to rep themselves in my newsletter. So I don't want to have to, it's not like huge banner ads. That didn't feel like in the spirit of what it was about. Um, but I, had a, I asked a couple of people about this, many of them kind of creative side project-y type people. And they were all like, oh, it's too much work. Just do banner ads, like every single one of them. Um, and I ignored them. And I just made a thing where you can buy an ad through my website, which is like run on Squarespace, and just fill out a form with the text you want and then I just paste the text. <laughs> so it's like a pretty low-tech solution um, that I just run through my website. And, um, and that has been way more lucrative than the asking people to pay for it directly. So like, you know, the, the appeal of the pie charts is suspect. <laughs> um, and it's also, it's interesting thinking about this in terms of, um, you know, love and money. I actually, like, having, having them be behind a paywall has made me not enjoy doing them as much somehow. I mean, I think I still have good weeks, but um, I don't know. I'm, like, thinking about, I, there's a lot of things here that are unresolved yet. So I'm, like, I'm definitely happy with these classifieds, and I'm happy with people who have been able to talk about their work in a space with my name at the top. Um, but the, the pie charts are still under consideration. Anyway, um, but overall it worked out. Like I covered my expenses and um, it's now like an income, an income source for me, which is great because having an income source that I control rather than waiting on editors to pay me is everything. Okay, this is this podcast that I co-host and in the beginning when I was talking about doing things with friends or doing things just to see if you could, um, that's what we did in 2014. Amina, who is a good friend of mine and my co-host, was like, all these dudes have podcasts, how hard can it be? <laughs> and my friend, my friend Gina is an audio producer, and so um, 
we started doing it. Uh, we started doing a weekly podcast, which is just a, like a conversational chat show between the two of us. And really my personal motivation for that was I want to learn a new medium because when you are self-employed, there is no like, oh, I want to apply for like the next step up the ladder in my job. There is no, there is no ladder. There's no one to like say, I think you're ready for a promotion. It's like, I have to say, what is a new skill that I want to acquire this year or what's a thing that I want to say I can do now? And so that's how that started. Um, and just in the past couple of months, it's become something that pays us as well. Um, you can sign with ad networks who will rep you and like companies like Squarespace, oh my God, I'm like doing it right now and it was a total coincidence, um, will pay you to shout them out on your podcast. And it's not like lots and lots of dollars, but it is something. Um, and then we also, we send a newsletter for the podcast as well. It's called The Bleed. Guess how often it comes out. <laughs> um, and we sell, we sell merch now too, which is like a tiny piece of the puzzle, like just like little buttons and stuff. But I thought I would throw it in there because there's like, there's like micro work that's like grown off of each of these projects, which is um, often more frustrating than it is rewarding, but we're still pretty, like this, these, these side projects to the side project are still pretty new. Um, and then I also make pie charts on commission that are like, I used to do them every month for Los Angeles Magazine. And those got like really bad. They were like not funny at all. I was really phoning it in. <laughs> and I stopped, I stopped doing them like last year. And so I think that there is a lesson here for me. Like, like the pie charts would be one example where the closer I try to push them to money, the less satisfying they get, the less weird they get, the less fun they are. Um, this donuts one was pretty fun. It was a thing I did for Lucky Peach pretty recently that I don't think has come out yet. Um, but that was just fun because I got to eat a lot of donuts, like not because of the pie format. Anyway, here's a weird meta photo of me talking because it's a thing I get paid to do. I don't even know why I made a slide because you're like watching me do it. Anyway, um, <laughs> just I just can't. <laughs> it's not my forte. Anyway, um, and so so like, but you know, for like most places do not have a ton of money. I'm truly here because I wanted to come to Oregon in the fall. Like that's really why I'm here. And um, it, let me tell you, it's so great. I don't know how many of you live right around here, but good choices, good life choices. It's phenomenal. Um, so anyway, so like, you know, little bit of money, little bit of love, little bit of vacation. Um, and then I have this little section on my website that says I'm a consultant, which is a, kind of a lie, but I put it there because people were emailing me about their like startups or whatever. I was getting a lot of those like, can I pick your brain emails? And when those are coming from like, you know, younger journalists who are just entering my field, those are, those are a thing that I answer and entertain. When they're coming from like, guys with like millions of dollars in VC funding, I'm like, you know, so I'm like, actually I provide a service in which I will talk to you for a certain amount per hour. Um, and I made a page on my website to make it seem real, which is the whole story of my freelance life too. I'm just like, if I put a page on my website that says this is like a service or a thing I do, yeah. Um, <laughs> And I know, I know it sounds really terrible, like, you know, someone, <laughs> I, I, was, I was telling someone about this and she's like, aren't you just like charging for coffee dates? Like, is that what you're doing? Is that, like, you're not really, like, consulting is a real job, right? And um, this is just here to show you that other people are being D-bags like me and also charging for their time <laughs> and calling it consulting. Anyway, um, and so <laughs> I, um, I incorporated last year, which was a huge step for me, which um, also makes really clear kind of like what is in the money pie as someone who's self-employed. My, my corporation is called Lady Swagger Inc., which I chose exclusively so I could have a credit card that says Ann Friedman, Lady Swagger. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but but it's, it's been a really interesting exercise. I think in, before I did that, it was a lot harder for me to conceive of all this stuff as somehow united as like a career or a business or like, you know, joined together as, as who I am. And weirdly, uh, making it legal with the state of California <laughs> really helped me um, get comfortable with that. Anyway, so um, I did this little exercise knowing that I was going to be talking about where the money comes from. And um, I, without like dollar amounts, kind of figured out like where, where my income came from over the progression of my freelance career, which I kind of gave you the overview of. But like in 2014, it was mostly writing money, 
There was, I did one very lucrative workshop with a friend who's a yoga teacher, that's what that green slice is, and a tiny bit of speaking and a tiny bit of pie, um, but mostly writing. And then you can see like the next year I like made a little newsletter money, I made a little consulting money, what's up? And um, <laughs> you know, and there's like a teeny slice for the podcast, like we just kind of had started. Um, and then when you get to this year, this is sort of like, you know, year to date or whatever, like those side project slices are like, have really started to grow. And, um, and I think that I am just starting to get a handle on what that means for me as a creative person who identifies primarily as a writer, despite all of the stuff I just talked to you about. That's where most of my anxiety goes. So that's how you know it's my primary creative output. <laughs> um, Anyway, and so in time-wise, like this is kind of what it looks like. It's like, like <laughs> you know, like that. That is really. I mean, and actually, like now that I look at it, I'm like the trying to write thing should be like bigger, you know, all the way over to half the podcast, whatever. I'm not. I'm not trying to edit on the fly. Um, but this is how it feels. <laughs> and um, so anyway, and so then um, there are a few things. It was. It was great to sit down and be like, okay, so what have I really preserved in? The, in the love corner of like that, that spectrum, you know? Because there definitely are things that maybe I had the option to try to do with them what I did with the newsletter or what we did with the podcast and I have actively chosen not to. Stuff that is like things I make creatively that I, that I have protected so, or do. So one of them is like I answer like at least 50, probably more emails a year from people who want advice about like being a journalist or being self-employed, um, mostly from young writers. I definitely answer all of those, often slowly, um, but it's a thing that is time consuming and that I'm doing and not trying to make money off of. Um, I, annual, I organize an annual trip to the desert for like 45 women where um, it's no one's 30th birthday and it's no one's bachelorette party and there's no agenda and we just hang out um, in caftans and leggings. And a f at one point, a male friend of mine was like, you know, you have a really great business concept here. It's sort of like Ted Women, but like that, you know what I mean? Like he was sort of, and he was like, you could conference -ize it. And, and um, I was like, definitely never. Um, I will never be like the, the maven of like leggings Ted, even though that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, protected. Um, Every year I make uh, my friend Bridget a collage calendar. It's just like a thing I do every year. <laughs> Definitely a labor of love. Um, it's just what I do, yeah. Um, I, make, I make really elaborate deviled eggs. And the reason why I put this on here, so I'm from the Midwest, Avi. Um, but I put this on here because like, after the third or fourth party where this was the thing I brought to the party, inevitably someone's like, you know, you could totally do like a deviled egg pop-up where you like, you know, I don't know. It was a, there, there is like this, this general push, I think, to be like, to, I don't know. I, I recognize the, the, the beginnings of like monetize this thing that you do for fun. Um, and I even thought of the perfect name, She Deviled. Best name for a deviled egg pop-up that I run. Um, but then I thought about the reality of like, what would your house smell like if you boiled that many eggs every weekend or anyway. The point is I will not be diversifying into deviled eggs. <laughs> um, I am making a deviled egg zine though <laughs> with all of my recipes. I don't know, I might, I might sell it, I'm, I probably won't. Um, I've been working on it for like a year, it might never get done. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, it's interesting, so I read a quote on the internet this week by some like dead white witty man that was like, when finance guys or bankers get together they talk about art, and when artists get together they talk about money. And um, you can probably Google it and source it, I'm being the worst journalist ever. But I, made, I had already made this, this whole presentation before I read it. And, and I was thinking about that. And um, anyway, and that, that was something that really, it, it, it's true. A lot of my conversations with creative people are like, but how are you making money off of that? But don't you want to make money off of that? But don't you want to quit this job you're doing that's only 50% creative? And um, yeah, and I don't know. Everyone's on a journey. So here is what I plotted. I plotted everything that I do or tried to. <laughs> on the spectrum. <laughs> and what's interesting is like, theoretically you should be able to draw a line where it's like, like on, on one side of it, everything is purely love, right? Like, like, it's pretty close to love. Like almost everything is in the gray area though. And like there's really, I wrote a feature for Delta Sky Magazine last year, which was really like the only thing I could think of that fits exclusively in money. Otherwise I never would have done it. <laughs> um, but pretty much almost everything on this like 
you know, in that middle two-thirds is um, weird and difficult and yeah, anyway. This is a cool exercise. I don't know if, if any of you are self-employed and kind of have a crazy patchwork um, of what you do. Uh, this was, it was really interesting for me to think about what I want to push in what direction and what I want to roll back. Um, this is just a peewee gif I really love. Um, but, uh, but the answer is like, I'm still thinking about like, what should I keep for myself? And, um, and it's also hard to think about what is, um, you know, I, I showed you that pie with my time, and there's all this admin time that didn't used to be there because when you are kind of like running a bunch of mini businesses, like you have to do a bunch of not creative work to keep them running. And, um, and I think that like the writing work I've done has really suffered in the past year. This is the most, this is the saddest thing. Um, has really suffered because I am really, I have spent the, the, past, the past year being more of like a creative business person than I have been like a, you know, a single-minded, single, single minded, hunched away, I mean, I still hunch, but like a writer, you know, just <laughs> plucking at my computer. Um, and, um, and so it's, I think it's an important thing to like keep checking in on, you know? I mean, do I make enough money on the newsletter to justify the admin time I spend, which takes away from writing, which is the thing I really care about? And um, again, luxurious questions, but um, you know, the, the deeper I get into the world of self-employment, the more, the more I'm starting to ask them. So. Um, I want to be clear, though, that I also don't hate myself for it because we all need money, and I don't think that it should be a taboo topic even among artists. So, um, I saw this. There's an illustrator that I really like named Cecile Dormo. I don't know. She's French, and I can't pronounce French. But um, and she she posted this as like an Instagram story, which is you know the, basically the perception of living, making your living as a creative person, just being like. I'm doodling, people are paying me, it's great. Versus like, you know, you're not getting paid enough. Or I would add like, you know, you spend a ton of admin time when you wish you were writing. The worst. Um, and just money stress in general is an inherent part of being paid to do what you love. So, I don't know, I'm kind of not really getting to a point, like again, <laughs> editing on the fly. Um, so, uh, I got to this point in making this presentation and I was like, wow, I haven't come to any conclusion about what is the right, th what is the truth? You know, how much should you try to monetize? And um, there, are a few, there are a few things that I think are guiding rules for me. Um, one of which is, like all of this stuff has started from a place of true interest and like dedication. Um, there is a designer, illustrator, artist named Austin Cleon who makes these newspaper blackout poems where he blacks out all the words and leaves a few, um, a few uh, readable and then they make a little poem. And he sent one last week that was like, um, is there money in this is the worst first question. And I think that, that, that that's pretty true in a way for me, which is it's not the worst question, but it's a really bad place to start from. And um, so I try not to. Um, and, and yeah, and also just like when I think back, like I started the pie charts because they made me laugh. And now I'm admitting to you, I started to think that I made myself laugh. Um, the podcast, just to see like if we could do it. The newsletter, because I miss certain aspects of editing and I also thought it would be fun. Anyway, that said, money is nice, money's important. Don't beat yourself up about wanting money. And, um, and this is what I'm trying to learn for myself right now, which is you can, you can in theory go back, right? Like if you are, you've made a choice to try to make money off something, you can always like shift that balance again. And I think I'm trying to remind myself, hey, if I wanna grow that piece of the writing pie again and really focus on that, just because I've started things doesn't mean I can't fold them or can't change direction because that's another theoretical benefit, at least, <laughs> of being self-employed. Um, or like to take it back to the spectrum, I could maybe shift where that, that line is um, and sort of say like, okay, actually, I'm still gonna do a lot of things for money, but I'm gonna push the line back and, um, and do more things like just for myself or just because I want to. So yeah, I don't know. Make a sliding scale and um, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me.